Psalm 136 today. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. The, the second half of this verse says, for his mercy endureth forever. And that phrase will appear in all 26 verses of this chapter. Praising God for his mercy because it endures forever. Wouldn't do as much good if it didn't. Because as long as we are living on this planet, no matter how much we love God, no matter how much we love Jesus, we need a fresh dose of his mercy every single day. And the good news is that God is not a quitter. And we benefit from that because he doesn't quit on us. Jesus never quits on us. Jesus never quits on anyone. It's people who quit on him. They love their sin more than they love him. They love error more than they love truth, so they quit on him. Many people choose to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin, even if it means burning in hell forever, so they quit on Jesus, and that's the deadly thing. Sin doesn't send people to hell. Sin doesn't send Christians to hell. Quitting on Jesus, losing one's faith, sends people to hell. But he doesn't quit on us. Sometimes people say, I don't know how God can forgive me this time. Did you ever say that? I don't know how God can possibly forgive me this time. Answer, the same way he forgave you the first time. It doesn't matter. The same way he has forgiven you every single time since. What difference does this time make? No one was worthy of God's forgiveness even the first time that they sinned. No one is ever worthy of God's forgiveness, so that's not even the issue. Don't even think in those terms. He forgives when we confess because he wants to, not because we deserve it sometimes. We never do. So God isn't a quitter, and we benefit from that because he loves us and he doesn't stop loving us even when we aren't very lovable. Verse 2. O oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. God is the God of angels. God is the God of kings. God is the God of all gods. You see, I thought there was no other God except him. That's right. But this is talking about idols. God is the God of idols. The God of the Bible rules over all. All so-called gods, too. The God of the Bible rules over that mythical being called Allah. The God of the Bible rules over Muhammad. The God of the Bible rules over the Hindu gods, millions and millions of them. The God of the Bible rules over the constellations and astrology. The God of the Bible rules over all things and all people. The God of the Bible rules over presidents, rules over dictators. The God of the Bible rules over sickness. The God of the Bible rules over accidents. God is ruler over all, which means that Almighty God controls the life of everyone and everything. Do you know that heart disease doesn't determine when we die? Cancer doesn't determine when we die. Walking out into the middle of the street and getting hit by a semi doesn't determine when we die. Those things may be the means by which we die, but they do not determine when we die. God determines that, not those things or anything or anyone. Ultimately, God is the sovereign one. And we are accountable to behave responsibly. It's true. But God is still sovereign. Even over the consequences of our careless acts, even over the consequences of our mistakes, he never loses control. He never loses his position as ruler of all things. Three, oh, give thanks unto the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. If he's God of gods, it figures he must be Lord of lords, too. 
There are many so-called lords today. In other words, there are many who are in charge of something or someone. But they are not lords by their own power. Jesus is the absolute Lord of all things. And the Bible says, no power given unto man comes to them except by God. Any authority that is, is established by God. That's what the Bible says. And so to the extent that someone is in charge of anything or anyone, it's only because Jesus is allowing them to share in his supreme lordship. And that's why God demands that those in charge rule in righteousness after the manner found in Holy Scripture. Verse 4. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. It is so easy for God to amaze people. The Bible says, to him who alone doeth great wonders, it's so easy for God to amaze us. And that's because people are used to the laws of science. People are used to the laws of nature. People are used to their routine. People are used to normal. They are used to their rational way of thinking and their logic. Nothing wrong with logic, but there is a problem with it when it excludes the omniscience and omnipotence of God. You got to take that into consideration. And people are so easily amazed. God answers a prayer that goes against the norm, and people are amazed. They're speechless. God does something in answer to prayer that the doctors say can't happen, and people are amazed. How about this one? Joshua was leading the armies of Israel after the death of Moses, he was leading them in battle. And Joshua needed a little bit more time to catch up and destroy the enemy who had attacked God's people. And so Joshua prayed. And God caused the sun to stand still for about a day. Just stopped the rotation of the earth, obviously. And Joshua and everyone involved was amazed. And understandably. But look at how easy it is for God to do something to amaze us. God can easily amaze us because he's not bound by the laws of science which he created. He can adjust them whenever he sees fit. Five. To him who by wisdom made the heavens for his mercy endureth forever. Anybody who thinks that the heavens popped into place by accident as a result of the Big Bang, number one, there's no scriptural support for anything like that. Number two, they're not very wise. You can't see that the heavens are put there by a person of wisdom, by someone who had wisdom, then you're blind. Every galaxy, every solar system, every speck of space dust, and I'm talking about every speck of space dust, every asteroid, every meteor, every meteorite, every comet, every sunspot, every solar flare, Every planet and everything in between them all has been made by God's power and by God's wisdom. God is the only one capable of doing those things because he's the only one who knows how to do it or has the power to do it. Six. To him who stretched out the earth above the waters for his mercy endureth forever. And that's pretty much how God did it too. If you read Genesis chapter one, the earth was all water. When God, in, his, in its initial state, the earth was covered with water. But God, when he caused the dry land to appear, he stretched it over the top of the waters. So even though this is poetic language, God did stretch the earth out over the waters. That's exactly what happened. Seven. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. Talking about the sun, talking about the moon, talking about the stars. Do you know that those things are a product of his mercy? He is very merciful to us in giving us those great lights. God put light in the sky. If he had not done that, then no matter what time of day it was, if we looked up, all we would see was black, pure black, total darkness, nothing. And, and this is just, uh, what's the word, hypothetical? 
because the fact would the fact is everything would be completely dark if God had made not made light but that's nothing that'd be the least of our problems nothing would grow without light nothing would exist without light he made light so that he could make us and provide for us light is very important eight the sun to rule by day for his mercy endureth forever the moon and the stars to rule by night for his mercy endureth forever you say I know what that means that means they rule over our lives that means they determine our fate no it does not mean that the sun the moon and the stars rule the sky meaning this they are the predominant things we see in the sky that is all that means the sun the moon the stars were all made for man's benefit not to control man they give light they give heat they serve as a clock they serve as a calendar they even serve as a compass yes the Bible says that they rule but don't take that too far don't take it out of the context of the entire Word of God as some people do people always get in trouble when they don't study from Genesis through Revelation and build a doctrine based on all the scriptures that talk about it but rather pull out a verse and build an entire doctrine out of one verse that's not how you get a balanced correct doctrine of anything and yes the Bible says they rule but don't take that out of the context of the entire scripture they rule but they do not rule in the sense of determining what will happen as astrology teaches the Bible certainly doesn't teach that astrology is a superstition inspired by the devil to get people's eyes off the sovereign God and to get people's eyes off God and to keep people from praying to him and trusting him it's a shot at God 10 to him who smote Egypt in their firstborn for his mercy endureth forever justice was dished out on Egypt with the death of their firstborn which resulted in mercy to God's innocent people who were at last released from a terrible slavery it took the death of the firstborn in Egypt to get them to set God's people free When people do not respond to the kindness of God or to the grace of God, he forces them to conform to his will by his judgment. It's their choice. How you want to do it? 11. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever, with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endureth forever. It was the powerful hand of God that brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. God didn't cause that suffering. God didn't make Pharaoh hold them captives. But he did use it to bring honor to himself from delivering Israel from it, which is something they never could have done for themselves. God is responsible for all the good things that happen to us. God is responsible for the lack of bad things that could happen to us and he deserves to be thanked for both he should not be taken for granted for both thank him for the bad things that do not happen to you thank him for the good things that do happen to you how unworthy we are of all of his benefits 13 to him who divided the Red Sea into parts for his mercy endureth forever and made Israel to pass through the midst of it for his mercy endureth forever God led his people out of Egypt after delivering them from Pharaoh led them right smack up against the the Red Sea there it was 1.5 million Israelites staring at the Red Sea and his people were trapped at least that's how they saw it they had the sea in front of them they had mountains on both sides of them and the Egyptian army coming up fast from behind and the Israelites thought God let us out here to kill us why did he do this so what did God do did he say for the first time in my life I think I've made a mistake what was I thinking I should have checked the GPS I should have checked the road map I should have checked the Atlas 
to see where I was leading these people. I really blew it this time. I led them the wrong way. Now they're trapped. What are we going to do? No, God didn't say that. He simply split the Red Sea and held the Egyptian army back with a pillar of fire so that his people could cross the ground safely. And by the way, God is never surprised by anything. The, the Israelites were surprised. They were surprised that God led them to the Red Sea. They were surprised when God parted the Red Sea. God's never surprised by anything. He never makes any mistakes either. He never makes mistakes in general. He never makes mistakes with us. So if we find ourselves in a jam, it's because God has allowed it. And he wants to accomplish something in it until it is time for him to deliver us. 15. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. Some people who tried desperately to deny the miracles of the Bible, liberal theologians, they're always denying the, liber the, the miracles of the Bible. They want to conform the word of God to their rational minds, and if it doesn't make sense, then they reject it, or they try to explain it away other than just, rather than just believe in it. Jesus didn't feed 5, 10, 15,000 people in total with five loaves and two fish. He didn't do that. He just got that little boy to share. That's what they say. They just can't bring themselves to accept the word of God. He just caused, Jesus just caused them to share. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a good trick. Because when maybe fifteen or 20,000 people ate that little boy's lunch, there was more food left over than, than they began with. What are you going to say about that? Their mouths are shut. They ain't going to say anything about it. Always denying the miracles of the Bible. Same thing with the Red Sea. God didn't really split the Red Sea, they say. See, what happened was they, they crossed the Red Sea on a sandbar. Oh. Well, that's a neat invention of your brain. Too bad the Bible never mentions a sandbar. It's just they got a lot of the land of make-believe. And it's so easy for a person to say things like that and to come across seem, you know, and seem so intellectual. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We can believe that. Uh, we can't believe that miracle. That's not intellectual enough. So, so easy to say stuff like that. But when a person is going to say something like that, deny the Bible, they really should preface their remarks by saying, I have no respect whatsoever for the written word of God. And, and now I say to you that they crossed on a sandbar. I don't believe the Bible is the word of God, which is why I can say they crossed on a sandbar. I don't believe that the Bible is true. I don't believe this book is, is uh, the word of God. I believe this book is full of lies. I believe this book is a fairy tale. I believe this book is a storybook, which is why I can say that they crossed the Red Sea on a sandbar. People who do not accept the plain words of Scripture have no respect for the Word of God. And when people do not respect the Word of God, they throw logic away. They throw God's wisdom away, and they always look up, they always end up looking stupid. They look up, they end up looking foolish, I should say. So, take this for example. Okay, the Israelites walked across the Red Sea on a sandbar. Okay, we'll give you that. Well, then could you please explain to me why the Egyptians drowned when they followed them? See, when people refuse to accept the word of God as it is, including the miraculous, including the unexplainable, they create problems for themselves. It's much, much easier to accept what the Bible says, even though we can't understand it sometimes. 16. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, everyone gets excited about the miracle of the Red Sea. And for good reason. It was pretty amazing. But many overlooked the miracle contained in verse 16. Israel was in the wilderness 40 years. But they didn't die of hunger, even though they couldn't plant any crops. 
They didn't die for lack of water, even though they didn't have a well. They didn't die of sunstroke. And oh yes, their garments and their shoes, according to the Bible, never wore out either. That's God's miraculous provision. Providence. And we need to know these things. And we need to think about these things because it's, it'll help us to obey God and to trust that he'll take care of us in the process. He, have many, he has many arrows in his quiver. He has many ways of providing. The Bible says that God's arm is not shortened, that it cannot save. 17, to him who smote great kings for his mercy endureth forever and slew famous kings for his mercy endureth forever. God fought for Israel. Good thing Israel's enemies were powerful and their kings were famous. Might have intimidated Israel, didn't intimidate God. The same God who split the Red Sea had absolutely no trouble at all removing Israel's enemies and making a smooth path for his people, and that's what he did. The enemy could have defeated Israel easily if it would have just been them against Israel, but God defeated them instead. He was merciful to Israel. God's judgment on the wicked is also God's mercy on the righteous. 19. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave their land for a heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. Even a heritage unto Israel, his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. Some people think that God was unfair and mean to do these things to these two rulers whose kingdom bordered the promised land. But remember this, the earth is God's property. And as I said last time, we are on his land, and those people that he removed had plenty of chances to repent, even at the very end, but they wouldn't, so God ran them off his property. He had every right to do that, just like you have every right to remove somebody from your property that's destroying you and destroying it or insulting you. They're 23. Who remembered us in our low estate for his mercy endureth forever and hath redeemed us from our enemies for his mercy endureth forever. The Bible says God remembered us in our low estate. When God's people were down and out, God did not forsake them. God is not a good time God. God is not a fair weather friend who leaves us when we are sad or in a bad mood, even if we brought those things upon ourselves by our sin, even if we deserve every single thing that we're getting. God sticks with us. His mercy endures forever. He sticks with us in our lowest state. He sticks with us even though everybody else may abandon us, doesn't matter. When we hit rock bottom and maybe don't have a friend in the world, God still wants us and God will have mercy on us if we turn to him. Now, he may not always do what we want, but he will always do what is best and he'll give us the grace to handle it as well. 25. Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Whether it's specific favors like a miracle or an answer to prayer because of an urgent need or more general favors like food, like water, they all come from God's mercy. They are God's mercy. Because as sinners, we don't deserve anything good. So anything good we have is a product of God's mercy. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, so that's what we deserve. You say, man, why do you always say that we don't deserve anything good? You're always saying we don't deserve anything good, right? Why do you say that? Well, number one, because I teach the Bible, and that's what the Bible teaches. You say, but are you trying to make us feel bad about ourselves? No. I'm trying to make you feel good about God. 
trying to get us to understand and never forget that God is merciful and he does not give us what we deserve and he should be recognized for that. And he should be appreciated for that. You know, when preachers fail to teach the depravity of man and the fact that we don't deserve anything good, they are attacking the grace and the mercy of God. Many preachers won't speak the truth about this issue because it often offends the pride of man. So what? Too bad. The truth is still the truth. But many preacher, preachers would rather coddle the pride of vile sinners than give God the credit for being kind to those who don't deserve anything but hell. And that's shameful to do that to God. God should be appreciated. Number one, because that's what he deserves. God should be appreciated. Number two, because it's good for us to be thankful. Keeps us from becoming prideful. Keeps us humble. And hopefully, it'll make us nice to others. Even though we don't think they deserve it. 26. Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. That's a good way to wrap up this, this whole psalm. The God of heaven is the one true God. He is good to all of us. All the good we have comes from God. All the good we have comes from God's mercy. So the least that we can do is say thank you, which is what the writer has been doing throughout this chapter. We should never stop doing that. Never stop thanking God.